Cleanse my guilt and pride Blood of Christ the crucified From your hands, your feet, your side Jesus, I trust in you We have Michael Boldea with us today. God bless you, Michael. Thank you so much for joining us. Michael is, of course, um, the head of um, Hand of Help Ministries. And, uh, Michael, I hope you'll come on and share something with us about Hand of Help Ministries. For those out there that don't know, you're pretty well known, I think, with probably most of our audience. But you might could share a few things about your ministry there and um you know what the lord is doing with you and um and 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 not only that how people can get in touch with you and how they could send um help uh, to you and so on and so forth okay well uh first of all thank you for having me i'm still uh, in wisconsin and it's brutally cold so anyone that's anywhere in warmer climates god bless you and say a prayer for those of us that are freezing <laughs> uh yeah. As as far as the ministry, it's 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 a work of benevolence that my grandfather started, and we continued, and God's been blessing, and we have an orphanage, and we feed uh, widows, and we feed orphans, and we try to raise them uh, in the light of the gospel, and and it's a good work. But I I think more important than you know is the ministry or our individual ministries is is I guess the callings that have been placed on the lives of those that have been warning this nation for so long. Uh, you know, I, I, I was actually in a place a few months ago where I was sincerely asking myself uh, the question if there was still a need for a prophetic ministry once a nation has entered the season of judgment. You know, uh, when, when a nation has entered the season of fulfillment, is there still, uh, you know, a need for ministries such as ours? And I, I almost talked myself into believing that there wasn't. You know, we've done our job. We can wash our hands and be on our way. We can uh, say, you know, this is as far as we've come. We've done all that we can. And then, you know, go about our lives. And God God rebuked me. He said, uh, you know, this, this is just the beginning. This is when it gets exciting. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't take a Bible scholar to see that we have entered a season of judgment in this country. Uh, I, I think that anyone can that, that can rightly divide what they see before their very eyes uh, can acknowledge the fact that, you know, we're in dire straits as a nation. And uh, if I were to tell you that it was going to get better anytime soon, or if I were to tell you that relief is on the way, that, uh, you know, all the opinions are true and all the exaggerated expectations of this man that was sworn in as president are true, and he's going to walk on water and cure cancer and multiply fishes and give you a new Mercedes... I'd be lying to you. Uh, you know, uh, things are not going to get any better because when God speaks a judgment against the nation, no matter how much man tries to change that judgment, no matter uh, what man implements in order to bring about, you know, some sort of resolution or bring about some sort of comfort from, from all the distress, it's not going to happen because God spoke it. Uh, we, we've been given so much time to repent in this nation. We've been given so much time to do the will of God, to repent of, of what we are, to repent of our deception, to repent of our heresy, to repent of the things that, you know, we believe that we're not of the Word of God. And yet we still gravitate towards these preachers that have absolutely no depth or substance, that speak nothing of the Word of God, that mention the truth only in passing, and... and they have these great swelling followings, and now these followers of these men who are nothing but, you know, whitewashed tombs uh, are, are beginning to see the reality of what's happening in the world and in their own nation. They're beginning to see the reality that maybe it's not all, uh, you know, rose petals and butterflies. Maybe hard times really are coming, and maybe we are going to be here for them. Uh, and, uh, you know, God, God actually had to rebuke me and say, look, your work isn't done. It's only beginning. I think that warning ministries are ministries who have been speaking a harsh word. I'm not going to say it's a comforting word. I'm not going to say it's an easy word. It is a harsh word against this nation, but it doesn't make it any less true. You know, ministries that have been speaking these words for years and years are going to see an explosion of growth because people are going to open their eyes and they're going to want to know the truth. Uh, you know, God is still speaking to his people. 
It's just the prism of what he is saying has changed. It's no longer I will judge, but I am judging. And in the midst of this judgment, the children of God have to be as lights. They have to be as strong towers to which men can point and say, he is not shaken. He is not disturbed. He is not fearful. He is not troubled of the things that he sees. Even though he's seeing the same things I am, and, and these things trouble me, and I'm fearful of them, something must be there in order for him to have that steadfastness and that faith. And we need to know as children of God that whatever may come, we are in his hands. God will stand with the saints. It's, it's throughout Scripture. It's undeniable that those who are of God will be protected of God. But, by the same token, there are those who chose to reject the truth, who chose to reject righteousness and found pleasure in unrighteousness, over whom God will send a strong delusion. Uh, it's, you know, th- these are the times. This is, this is why, you know, I'm, I'm very excited and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to get closer to God to seek out the face of God, and uh, to, to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. So this is, this is where I am right now. I just got home from Romania. I was with my dad for a while, and we did some great work. We uh, helped a lot of people with firewood since uh, Mother Russia cut off the gas. Uh, they, they decided that Europe could freeze uh, this winter, and so without <laughs> any sort of warning, they just shut off the gas. And all of Europe uh, basically went begging uh, to Russia and said, look, we, we, we would like you to turn the gas back on, please. Uh, there were no overt threats. Nobody was saying, well, you know, we, we should really uh, show Russia what we're made of. No, when, when it came to, you know, their own families freezing to death, people tended to be a little more uh, malleable. And so with hat in hand, they went and, and Russia turned it back on about seven or ten days later. And, you know, God had told us to prepare for those times. He had told us to prepare for those things. And so we bought a lot of coal. We bought a lot of tar. We bought a lot of firewood ourselves. And so it didn't affect us in any way. You know, this is the beauty of being a child of God, the foreknowledge of the things that are to come and the fact that God will not he, leave his children in ignorance. Uh, it, it's, it's the most beautiful thing to me. But I'm rambling. This is, this is just say hello. Brother Dave? Well, Michael, I wonder what <clears throat> what people in Europe are going to do and think in the days to come when it gets very, very cold. I, I, you know, forget about the warming issue. <laughs> and uh, and basically, there is um, there is a threat held over their head. You know, by one who will ultimately end up being their enemy. What do you What do you think about that, Michael? Well, I, I, I think uh, they will do whatever Russia tells them to do. I, I, I think uh, Russia has done a superb job of uh, hoarding every natural resource that all of Europe requires. You know, there are nations in, in the European, European Union even that are 100% dependable on, on Russian gas. And so, you know, they're, they're not going to bite the hand that feeds them because there's no other hand that's going to reach out and feed them. Uh, there's only one. They have no other source of natural gas other than Russia. And uh, it, they're, they're, they're pretty much at, at Russia's mercy, to be honest with you. As far as global warming is concerned, I was walking through a marketplace in Romania, and it was like minus 10 degrees. It was one of those cold days. And I heard two people over talking. I, I just started laughing. We go, wow, you know, thank God for global warming. Imagine how uh, cold it would be without it. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's... It's, it's uh, getting desperate in a lot of places in the world. And, uh, you know, there, there are still people in this country that are cocooned. There are still people in this country uh, that don't know really what's happening throughout the world. But their eyes are slowly but surely being opened. They're beginning to feel, uh, you know, the same stress. They're beginning to, uh, you know, understand what hunger is. They're beginning to understand what not having any money in your pocket is. And uh, the, the Christians, at least, those that, that call themselves Christians, are beginning to understand that money really doesn't bring happiness. That having money doesn't mean you have security or comfort or safety or peace or joy. Having money is just having paper. Uh, you know, and, and they're beginning to see the fallacy of all these teachings that they've heard over and over again. I mean, one of my biggest struggles in ministry was trying to, to get people to look 
towards heaven, to seek the things of heaven rather than the things of earth. And, and for every sermon I preached, there were 15 guys that were saying, you know, call money down. You gotta call money down from heaven because if you don't have, uh, you know, if you don't think money makes you happy, then you don't have enough of it. And people would come to me and go, what do you think of brother so and so? He, he's saying that, you know, we're supposed to seek after riches. I'm like, look, in the end, it doesn't matter what I think is what the Bible thinks. The Word of God has to have the final authority. It has to have the, the, the absolute last word. If it doesn't, then, you know, we, we have no anchor. We're in a storm and we're being beaten about the waves without any sort of uh, relief in sight. But if the Word of God has the final authority and the Word of God says to seek first the things of God, to seek first the kingdom of God, to seek after those things that are non-perishable, that don't lose value, that can't crash, that can't burn, and if we seek those things, we will realize the futility and uselessness of material things. Uh, you know, this, this has been the biggest struggle with the American church, and I think right now the American church is beginning to wake up to the reality. Uh, I, you know, I said it five, six years ago when uh, everything seemed to be booming, that, you know, mega churches were going to be shutting its doors and they were going to be empty, and people were laughing at me. I, I, I was actually in a service where, where people started laughing. Yeah, that's never going to happen. These people are just going to grow and grow. Well, mega churches are shutting their doors because not rooted in the Word of God. They were not teaching the truth. There was no substance to their message. And a feel-good message can only be applied in feel-good times. When, when, when things start to hurt, uh, you know, the feel-good message kind of falls on deaf ears and you start looking for the truth. And it's time for us to provide the truth to, to the people of God and to those seeking it. Because a lot of people will be seeking the truth in the next few months. Things are not getting any better by a long shot in this country. Because God has spoken judgment and now he's fulfilling what he's spoken. Uh, I'm, I'm expecting, you know, very quickly uh, many things to happen in this country, some of them being natural disasters, uh, upheavals within this country, even uh, uprisings, if you will. Uh, and all these things are leading up to, to what the Word of God said will happen to Babylon. Uh, it's, it's in the book. We can't deny it. We can point the finger to Iraq and say, well, you know, we got time because Iraq is going to be a global power again and because they're the Babylon of Revelation, and I've actually had friends that went out and bought Iraqi currency because they thought it was going to blow up in value, and now no American bank will take it, you know, uh, because they, they didn't study the Word of God, because they didn't get deeper than, than what they heard from other people, and so they got taken in. It's time to know the truth, because deception will only grow. You know, at first the truth was absolute, then it was relative and subjective. Then it was only mentioned once in a while. And now, you know, within the house of God itself, it can be quantified in parts per million. You know, deception grows. It doesn't stop growing. Because the more it can devour, the more it knows it's done its job. You know, the hard economic times that we're starting to enter into here, we haven't really seen anything yet, I'm convinced. But um, I believe this is going to wake a lot of people up. You really, you know, when you get... You're facing this kind of a thing. You really know that you need substance from God. You know, it's, and, and I believe that's one reason the prosperity ministries are, are crumbling. For one thing, they all went into debt, contrary to God's word. They went into deep debt. And for another thing, I think that as these economic times get harder, uh, people are going to wonder, now, why in the world does a man need five airplanes at one time? You know? <laughs> And, uh, you know, this this kind of wakes people up, you know, I think. And, uh, well, yeah, it's and, and, and the excuses are going to sound hollow after a while. You know, when, when, when the person listening to them can barely afford to buy a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread for their kids, uh, and the person telling them to give, you know, owns three mansions and uh, drives around in $300,000 cars, you know, it, it's going to start to make sense. Uh, you know, it, it's amazing that people haven't opened their eyes uh, you know, until now, that, that it, it's taken so long and it's taken, you know, such a shaking in this country for people to begin to open their eyes. And there are still some that will not open their eyes because they've been given over to a strong delusion. Why? They found pleasure in unrighteousness. You know, that's, that's the most tragic thing about prosperity preachers. I'd have nothing against a man, you know, uh, you know, if he had a plane and a, and a mansion, if he chose to live that way, uh, that's between him and God, if he preached the truth. 
But these people know that by preaching the truth, they're never going to get the mansions. They know that by preaching the truth, they're never going to get the airplanes. Because if they preach a lukewarm gospel, that's when you get the crowds. If you preach salvation without sacrifice, that's when you get the crowds. If you preach a cheap grace, that's when you get the crowds. If you preach the truth of God's word, uh, it's a little slimmer, and the crowds don't come out, because uh, they want to hear good things, and they want to be made happy. It's not about our happiness here on earth. It's about eternity with God. You know, it's so simple, little kids perceive it and understand it, and yet we as grown men and women desire so much to cling to this earth that we don't realize what God has prepared for us. Well, you know, when you're in hard times, you really want to know how to get your next meal. You're not really worried about, you know, believing for the preacher's airplane, you know. <laughs> so I um, I think that they want to hear people who've lived by faith, not people who talked faith. You know, the prosperity folks, they do a pretty good job of talking faith. But the problem with the, their faith is it's all to gain from God. It's not... It's not prospering as your soul prospers, as the Bible says, you know. Look at the people in the Scriptures. You, you know, these people didn't have any time uh, for the care, cares of this world or the deceitfulness of riches. They had no time for that, no ambition for that. Their ambition was to see souls brought into the kingdom and to become stable and to walk as Jesus walked. You know, that's their ambition, the only ambition they had. And uh, they couldn't carry all that with them anyway. And even Jesus sent them out saying, don't, you know, get you no gold or silver in your purses. Because he wanted them to be people of faith. And obviously a preacher can't be trusted unless he is a person of faith. You can't trust them. Because people who have to walk by faith, number one, they have to walk with God. Because if you're walking by faith in God to supply your needs, and you're not walking with God, you're going to fail. And the only... Only other thing you can do is to manipulate, put people under the law to give you money to build your own kingdom, and that's what they do. Well, the thing about walking in faith is having absolute trust in God. Uh, when, when we started Hand of Help, when we started our ministry, uh, we started it in a two-bedroom apartment, uh, and we did it because God told my grandfather to start a ministry. I mean, it was that simple. And I look back on now in 2009, it's going to be 25 years since the ministry started. And I look back at all the lives that have been affected by it, all the people, uh, you know, that we built homes for, all the churches that we built, the orphanage itself, all the meals that we served. And, and we realized the good work that came out of it. And it came out of it without any sort of, uh, you know, I guess manipulation uh, is the best way I can put it. It came without any sort of making false promises to people. I've never taken an offering in my life. I will put my hand on the Bible before anyone and say, I myself have never taken an offering in my entire life. And yet, somehow, God provides, and he provides miraculously. And all we can do is fall to our knees and, and cry and pray and say, Lord, thank you. Uh, it, it's, it's having that implicit trust in God. Look, I can't say that I, I, at the beginning of this year I didn't look at what was happening and I knew that it was coming and, and start to think, how am I going to feed the kids? But then I looked back in the Word of God and saw the just shall live by faith, and I said, Lord, I have faith. I know that you will feed those kids supernaturally if you have to. I know that you will provide. And God has provided every step of the way. You know, our God's hand is not short. And the thing about giving to a worthy cause, I guess, is the best way I can put it. And giving because God told you to give, is you're never going to look back on what you gave and say, I didn't get what the guy promised me. Because every gift that people give to ministries, uh, especially these television ministries, you know, they're always to get something back. It's, 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 it's always that, you know, Ponzi scheme. If I send $100, I'm going to get 1000 back. So I'll send 1000 to get 10 back. Uh, and, and, and it becomes this, this, this downward spiral and eventually people grow bitter and resentful and it's not against the man that lied to them. They grow bitter and resentful against God because that man warped their mentality and warped their vision of who God is and what God does and what God's desire and purpose for our life is. You know, God doesn't care that I have money in my pocket or that I don't. His first priority is that I am in right standing with him, that I have been reconciled unto him by believing in his son, Jesus Christ. 
Then if he chooses to bless financially, so be it. If he chooses to try me, so be it. The only thing that God is concerned with is that we be with him in eternity. Everything else pales in comparison to this one thing. And, and I've heard people, I, I, they, they were being interviewed, that, that said the most outrageous things. He goes, God's uh, first interest and his only desire is for me to prosper. I'm sorry, show that to me in the Bible. Please, I, I, I'd like to see it. You know, people butcher the word of God so often and on so many levels that, you know, you, you hear it often enough, you, you start to believe the lie. And you go, well, yeah, I guess I am supposed to prosper. No, you're supposed to be saved. And those that are saved are supposed to grow from grace to grace and glory to glory. There is a journey that we must undertake as children of God, and the time has come for, for us to make sure that our armor is on, that we know how to use the weapons of our warfare, because, man, hard days are coming. I, I had planned with all my heart, and I'm being as honest as I can with your audience, to not be here anymore. I had planned to move back to Romania and go be with my wife and have a couple kids and have a normal life and work for my father-in-law because he's got a business. And, and God rebuked me to the point that I, I, I fell to my knees in tears. And, and he said, you're not going anywhere. Your work's not done. You know, we have to bend to the will of God. Otherwise, God will break us. And then we have no choice but to bend to his will. You know, I don't want to be here, but I'm here because God desires me to be here. God commanded me to be here. And I know that the work that he has in store for, for ministries that have kept the truth alive, for ministries that preached an uncomfortable truth, uh, even in the times of greatest prosperity, those ministries God will bless in supernatural ways. Amen. And uh, I agree with you, Michael. Uh, there's nothing biblical about you know, taking up offerings. In fact, I call that an oxymoron. Taking an offering is, that's kind of contrary. Those two words don't even fit together, you know. Um, <laughs> and I have, you know, for 30 something years, I've never ever taken up an offering, but I have sought first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and He said all these things will be added unto you. He didn't say you have to go out and beg. We don't even have, we don't have one example in the scriptures of Him doing that. We have examples of a couple of places where they actually took up an offering for the brethren who were in other cities who were struggling. And, uh, of course, that wasn't for self. Nobody took up an offering for self in those instances. But uh, I learned that I don't really have to worry about the money. You know, when I first went into the full-time ministry, um, there was nothing there. There was no support from anybody. I was just taking a step out in faith and um and, uh, you know, I, I learned, uh, that I could live on the edge of disaster and that all those threats that the devil would whisper in my ear never would actually come to pass as long as I was seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I believe that means seeking first the kingdom of God in your life and for others and his righteousness in your life and for others. And I believe you never have to worry about God supplying if you'll do that. He said one other thing about uh, receiving money. He said, give and it'll be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, um, shall men give unto your bosom, right? And so, you know, you can a person can actually make a living by giving. I've said that many times. And I'm not talking, and I never teach about giving to me. I never do that, never have done that. But I'm talking about giving to the needs you see around you. The Bible says if you see your brother in need and you withhold your compassion from him, how does the love of God abide in you? You know, we're not talking about giving to a ministry. We're talking about giving to people around you that have needs, you know. And uh, if a person will do those two things, they'll never go without. They'll never go without. Now, some people have a, a selfish ambition. They want to be the biggest ministry around. Not necessarily that God wants that, but they want that. And so then they have to fall off into this manipulation because they can't walk by faith because if they tried to walk by faith that God would give it to them instead of begging and manipulating, uh, since God doesn't really want them to have the kind of ministry that their, that their ambition, uh, is after, uh, then their faith that fails them. So they have to resort to manipulation and, and the prosperity preachers are the worst about it. They'll tell you exactly what they're believing for. <laughs> then you feel like you're a little responsible if you or, or guilty if you don't help them get it, you know. Well, that's crazy. You know, if you go to God, Jesus said, first of all, when you pray, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you received them. If you believe you received them, are you going to go out and beg or, or manipulate other people? No, these people really don't have faith in God. 
That's the problem. And their ambition is bigger than their head, you know. So, you know, I, I think that if we just are content, like like Paul said in Timothy 6, you know, uh, godliness with contentment is great gain. And we brought nothing into the world, and we we're going to take nothing out of it. If we're just content, but we're, we're um, faithful with what God puts in our hands, uh, he can just do awesome wonders, awesome miracles. The only people God can really trust with money to do his will is the people who don't have an ambition for it in the first place. You look at those disciples in the scriptures and look at Jesus. A simple life is all they ever led. They did not need all these things the prosperity preachers do. That lets you know those are not trustworthy men. I mean, they cannot. They, You know, I like what um, uh, is said in um, Song of Solomon. Excuse me. Um, in in uh, Ecclesiastes. You know, um, he talked about the uh, what, what good does it do to multiply riches when all you can do is look on it, you know, uh, and that it's it's hurtful to you to do that, he tells you, you know. And uh, so I, I, you know, I feel if we're all faithful with what God, good stewards of what God puts in our hands, that um, that he will multiply it to do his will as long as it keeps on flowing through our hands to uh, help other people and to build the kingdom. And how you feel about that, Michael? Um, it's biblical. So, uh, you know, when, when, when something is in the Word of God, I'm not allowed an opinion. I, I, I've held to this belief for a very long time. Uh, my, my, my grandfather used to teach head coverings for, for infants, you know. Uh, and uh, after, you know, he passed away, people would ask me, you know, do you believe like your grandpa did about head coverings? I'm all, it's in the Bible. You know, why, why do we have to have this, this discussion? You choose whether you wear a head covering or not. Uh, but as far as it being biblical, yes, it's biblical. So it, it's in the Word of God, but in order to have faith, faith must be cultivated. You know, this, this is what the prosperity preachers really don't want. In order to cultivate faith, you need a lot of time on your knees. You need to have scar tissue there. Uh, you know, you, you need to cry out to God. You need to submit and surrender, and their pride won't let them either submit or surrender to God. You know, I honestly, you don't want to hear my opinion of some of these men, because if they truly feared God, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. I, I believe they've already been given over. I, I, I honestly do. If, if a man truly feared God, he couldn't stand there and, and look into the camera and tell the lies that they tell, and give people false hope and false expectations that, that are not biblical, that are extra-biblical. And people do as they're told. They write the check and they send it in and they sit there waiting rather than go into the Word of God and, and feed themselves and nourish themselves spiritually. They sit and wait to win the lottery. They sit and wait to get run over by a bus so that they get a, you know, a big insurance claim. Whatever it is, you know, it, it's time to look to the kingdom. It's time to seek righteousness because there is no substitute for righteousness. And, and the, the darkness isn't coming. The darkness is here. Uh, I, I believe that we are going to see persecution very soon in this country. And I know full well that right now uh, it's not going to take persecution to cause a lot of people's hearts to grow cold. It's, all, it, it's only going to take absence of prosperity. Uh, you're going to see an exodus from a lot of churches like you've never seen before, or a falling away, if you will. Because people will say in their hearts, this is not the God that I serve. This is not the God that the preacher presented to me. I'm not getting my raise. I'm not making any more money. I'm even losing my house. What's up with this? Because the preacher said God's just there with a big Santa Claus bag and he just pulls out presents all the time. That's his job. Because we've misrepresented what God is. God is just and holy and righteous. And God is jealous. We've misrepresented God so often in this country from pulpits that people don't know the true nature of God and the true attributes of God anymore. And then you wonder why so many people are confused. You know, it, it, it's time to, to speak the unabashed truth regardless of what people will say. Yes, I believe that if you speak the truth, you will soon be persecuted in America. I believe that if you will stand for the truth, they will take you before uh, judges and they will take you before powerful men, also that you will have an opportunity to preach the truth because the Word of God doesn't lie. The Word of God is as effective and as relevant for us today as it was for the apostles back then, and men still harbor the same hatred in their hearts as the Roman Empire did towards the Christians. And if they could, they would 
feed you to the lions and burn you alive just as quickly as the Romans did. This is, this is the truth, because the heart of men doesn't change. It is exceedingly evil. And men without God in their hearts harbor hatred beyond your imagination. You know, Christians, when, when they were in power, if you would like to call it that, were merciful, because our nature is to be merciful. Uh, now you will see what mercilessness can be. Amen, amen. And I agree with what you said about the head covering thing. You know, where there is uh, prosperity, as they call it, prosperity, there's a lot of vanity. And, uh, you know, I, I I dare say, and I don't know this, but I'll ask you this question, Michael. In um, Back in your country, um, is there such is there so much vanity about the head covering? Isn't it easier for people to believe in it over there for some reason? Uh, the, the, there there is no contention over the head covering. That's what they, I thought. They, even the word of God, cover your head because of the angels. That's yes. all it says. It doesn't go into detail, but it must be a good thing since the angels of God are in the house of God and 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 they're walking about laying hands on those whose heads are covered. You know, I mean, you can ex- extrapolate and, and come to a conclusion that wearing a head covering will bring about a spiritual blessing. And so they don't debate it. They don't say, well, you know, I, I did my hair yesterday, and so I can't put something on it. <laughs> uh, you know, there, there is no vanity about it. All of our churches, you know, all, all the sisters come with head coverings on, and, and they come humbly before God, and you can see joy on their faces. Because they're walking in obedience with God. I, I, I'm tired of the plastic smiles I, I see in so many churches today, those forced smiles where you only see the teeth, but, but, but the smile really doesn't extend to the eyes. And, and why, why do you do that? I, I actually asked the lady, if you don't want to smile at me, you don't have to. But, but don't grin at me in a way that scares me. Uh, there, there is no real joy because all that they're concerned with is looking better than the person next to them on the pew. Uh, all they're concerned with is, is keeping up with the Joneses, as the saying goes. And this is one of the reasons that, that the nation is in the shape that it's in. And, and right now, uh, they, they find themselves far, far away from anything resembling the truth or Christ. You know... Um the church is going to come back into a sense of community, you know, like it did in the book of Acts. That's where we're headed, folks, and, and because people are not going to make it otherwise. And one thing the Bible is very, very clear about, and that is that um, there needs to be some equality. You know, the Bible says in Second Corinthians um, chapter 8, verse 12, it says, uh, for if the readiness is there, it's acceptable, according as a man hath, not according as he hath not. For I say not this, that others may be eased and you distressed, but by equality, your abundance being a supply at this present time for their want, that their abundance also may become a supply for your want, that there may be equality, even as it is written, he that gathered little, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. And, of course, most people, when they go back in Exodus, they um, apply that to the manna, but God is applying it to meeting our needs. Uh, and, uh, you know, I remember also what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. He said um, in chapter 5 and verse 10, he said, He's a, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. Uh, nor he that loveth abundance with increased. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. In other words, you know, whatever the supply of the world is, there is enough to supply the needs of the people of the world. Unless some people uh, overindulge to the extent somebody does without. Listen to what he says again. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what advantage is there to the owner thereof, save the beholding of them with his eyes? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eateth little or much, but the fullness of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. There is a a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, namely, namely riches kept by the owner thereof to his own hurt, and those riches perish by evil adventure. And if he hath begotten a son, there, there is nothing in his hand. So on and so forth. I mean, it's uh, very plain that God's plan for all of us is to make sure we meet one another's needs. 
you know, you can make a living by making sure your brother's needs are met. You give, and it will be given unto you. I know the preachers use that verse uh, for their own um, lusts, but it's the truth. It's the truth if you don't twist it and wrench it all out of context. If you make sure the brothers around you's needs are met, if you make sure other people's needs are met, God will make sure your needs are met. And, and of course, you know, Paul was very plain in uh, 2 Timothy 6 about it being needs, not greeds. You know, um, uh, that's those selfish, greedy ambitions for more and more things and fancier and fancier things. That's lust. That's lust of the flesh. That drowns men in destruction and perdition. That's what Paul said. But but a godly man will be content. You know, he says um, in 1 Timothy 6, he said, The wranglings of men corrupted in mind and bereft of the truth, supposing that godliness is a way of gain. That's, their, that's them, you know. The godliness is a way of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and, and neither can we carry anything out. But having food and covering, we shall be there with content. We shall be there with content. But they that are minded to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare, and many foolish and hurtful lusts, such as drown men in destruction and perdition. Why would you want to follow these prosperity preachers? Look what it's done to them. It's destroyed them. They've got no conscience. They can see their brothers in need, and yet they got to have five airplanes and four runways, you know, for goodness sake, you know. And verse 10, uh, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which some reaching after have been led astray from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In other words, God's making a promise to us here. You know, if that's your ambition, you want to be rich, you want to have all these um, luxuries of the world, then he's making promises to you here, you know, that you will be pierced through with many sorrows. He said, But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Lay hold on the life that's eternal. In other words, he's telling you what's eternal life. There's not prosperity. Eternal life is very plain. It's righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Lay hold on the life eternal, whereunto thou wast called. This is what we're called to. And it's confessed the good confession in the sight of many witnesses. It's not a confession to be rich. It's a confession of what the Lord has given to you as far as his life. His righteousness, his purity, his holiness, you know. And um, what do you think about that, Michael? Well, I, I was actually uh, rifling through the word, and I found another scripture that I, I think says well. It's in uh, Philippians 2. Uh, and uh, it's, it's basically Paul's exhortation to the brethren. He says in uh, Philippians 2, verse 3, 3 and 4, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And, and, and this should be the heart of, uh, of a child of God. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with, with having ambition. There is, however, something wrong with having selfish ambition. You know, it, it's a strong desire to gain a particular objective. And so... If your ambition is to know more of God or to get deeper into the Word or to help the poor or to preach the gospel, all these are noble endeavors. They're noble ambitions. Now, the minute that ambition is coupled with selfishness or conceit, it's transformed into a monster that's willing to step on anyone's dying corpse, that's willing to betray and otherwise cast aside the closest of friends because there's only one objective for the selfish and the conceited, and that is the end result. And if the end result is attained well, the means by which they were attained is no longer of any consequence to them. You know, this is what we've been teaching in the churches today. We've been teaching selfishness and hedonism. This, this is the scary thing. When, when all the material things are stripped away, when, when money no longer has any value, when all the things that they trusted in so vehemently are taken from them, where will they turn? 
Will they shake their fist at God as, as, as the word tells us? Will they become embittered at God and, and walk out of his house and say, you know, well, God disappointed me? Or will they turn and repent? You know, is it any wonder that the spiritual condition of this nation, uh, you know, is what it is? Given that most pulpits are teaching the opposite of what the word of God teaches. You know, although Christ and all the apostles continually focus upon selflessness and lowliness and meekness and humility, uh, a great majority of today's self-anointed spiritual leaders are preaching an unapologetic form of self-centered humanism. I think that's the best way I can put it. That goes far beyond what those of the world dared to teach when the self-help movement was at its peak. You know, the church took the self-help movement and they put it on steroids. This, this is what happened. They, they took the message of Tony Robbins about looking in the mirror and smiling at yourself, and they shot it up with steroids, and, and, and they came up with the prosperity movement. You know, selfish ambition and conceit lead men to desiring praise for their endeavors. It leads men to desiring recognition and prominence, and, and it leads men to desiring things only for themselves. And such men have no qualms about being their own best spokesperson, constantly bringing themselves to the forefront, inflating their accomplishments, packaging themselves in such a way as to seem better than their fellow brothers in Christ in whatever they choose to do, in whatever their chosen field of ministry might be. And when someone insists that they're a better preacher than their brother, that they pray with more fervor than their sister, that they sing better than others standing beside them on the platform, or that they contribute more to the work of God than fellow bondservants in Christ, they do this out of conceit and, and, and a desperate desire to be acknowledged. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I don't surf the Internet a lot, but I get on there sometimes, and I see, you know, right now everyone with an uh, Internet connection has become a biblical scholar. And, and all they're doing is flinging mud at people who've been in ministry for decades. And, and they're coming up with these insane ideas, and, and they make up their doctrine as they go along, all because they, they desire to be acknowledged. They desire to have what other ministers have, not realizing that, you know, it, at, at least for my ministry, all, all I can say is, at least for my ministry, I'm not the one that built it up. It's God that built it up, and God gave it to me, and if God desires to give it to you, by all means, He'll tell me, I'll give it, I'll walk away, because my heart is not tethered to the ministry itself, my heart is tethered to God, and all I want to do is His will. Now, people who desire to be acknowledged, and people who desire and are conceited and, and aspire to greatness, aren't willing to surrender anything to God. All they want is more for themselves. And they're willing to trample on anyone and anything to, to get to the place that they desire. And such men do nothing for the cause of Christ. They're not in ministry to further the kingdom of God or the gospel of Christ. They are in ministry simply to promote themselves and to amass followers and to achieve prominence. To them, the sheep of God's house are there simply for the fleecing. And there is no proven method that has worked better over time than to you know, keep the sheep coming back for more than to tell them that, you know, they're okay. To tell them what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. The beautiful thing about the Word of God is that when it gives a specific instruction, it also provides the means by which we can accomplish that which has been required of us. If, if these verses would have simply said, let nothing be done through selfish ambition of conceit, one might have readily asked, how can we do that? How can we make certain that nothing we do is, is done through selfish ambition or conceit? Now, in His goodness, God reveals to us the means by which we can ensure that nothing we do is done to these two soul-crippling and sinful states. We keep ourselves free from snares of selfish ambition and conceit by perpetually walking in lowliness, humility, regarding, respecting, and prizing our brothers and sisters better than we do ourselves. And I don't know how I got to this topic, but it's where God led me. And I know that this is a bitter pill to swallow for a lot of people. To prize your brother and your sister higher than yourself. To see them better than you see yourself. Nobody does that anymore. Everybody wants to beat their own chest and everybody wants to stand on the mountaintop and wave a flag and say, I made it. 
why, why, why can't we realize that what Christ desires of us is, is deeper than how many people we have on our mailing list or how many people support our ministry or how many people watch our television program or how many people listen to our radio programs? God desires us to be like Christ, to mirror His Son. And His Son never desired adulation for Himself. He always took the glory that people showered upon Him and, and transferred it to the Father. The Father, that he, he always pointed to God, even though He was worthy of praise, even though He was worthy of adulation, He still pointed to God because He knew that it was what He must do. Why do we, as men, you know, take the glory and not lay it at Christ's feet? Why do we as men take the ministry and the finances and, and everything else that, that God provides and hoard it for ourselves rather than laying it at Christ's feet? You know, if every minister that called himself a minister in America today would do this one thing, lay their ministry down at Christ's feet and, and do as he requires, just, just do the will of God without questions, without concessions, just do it. The world itself would be a different place today. Amen. Amen. Sorry, I got carried away. <laughs> we like that. Well, um, I like what Jesus said here in, um, in Luke 12. He said, verse 32, he said, Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Uh, and, of course, he's not talking about the kingdom of this world. He's talking about God's kingdom where your needs are supplied, you know, you're healed, you're blessed, you're delivered from the curse, you're delivered of demons, you're so on and so forth. God's kingdom, where he rules, in other words, you know, where he reigns, especially over your enemies, right? Uh, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that which you have and give alms and make for yourselves purses which wax not old. In other words, don't hoard it up and keep it so that you can trust in it because it, you can't help it if you do that. If you hoard it up, you'll end up trusting in it. It's just uh, human nature, right? So, so he says, get you no gold and silver in your purses. That's why he sent his disciples out like that. Um, Make for yourself purses which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not. People want to know, how are my needs going to be supplied in the coming wilderness? You know, well, he's telling you right there. You make sure everybody's needs are met around you. You store it up in heaven, and it will not fail you. You know, because you can always get your needs met because you have given like God said, right? Where no thief draweth near, neither moth destroyeth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In other words, if, you, if a treasure to you is something that you pack in your pocket <laughs> or, or something that you drive, or something that you live in, instead of the gold and the silver and the precious stones of the godly life, as opposed to the the um, wood, hay, and stubble that burns up in the fiery trial, right? If that's a treasure to you, you missed the whole point. That's something you have to be fighting against all the time. Remember these disciples. Their, their only ambition was souls. Uh, remember the Great Commission that the Lord gave us. The most important thing to him was souls. And I'm not just talking about bringing somebody in the kingdom and dropping them. I'm talking about uh, raising them up to be disciples of Jesus Christ. A soul saved is a disciple of Jesus Christ. Not somebody that accepts Jesus as their personal Savior. That's not in the Bible. There's There's multitudes of people out there in the world who've come to church accepted Jesus as their personal Savior, went back out in the world because they got no food to sustain them to walk as a son of God, and they're back out there in the world right now. And they're lost as a goose. And they don't know which way to go. You know, uh, a soul saved is a soul that looks like Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, is a person who has no ambition for this world. I'm talking about the things in this world, the love of the world, the deceitfulness of riches. They don't have any of that in them. You know, they're just as content as they can be serving the Father and serving His kingdom. And, uh, you know, Jesus, in in that same chapter, He uh, made a really good point. In verse 15, He says, Take heed and keep yourselves from all covetousness. You know, we think of that word as a, is, a, is an evil word in itself, but actually it just means desiring more. 
That's what the word means. Oleonectes, I believe it is. Uh, desiring more. And, and we're told in uh, Ephesians 5 and 5 that the covetous person is an idolater. An idolater. This is somebody who has a false god. The prosperity people have a false god. They have a lust for their flesh, to feed their flesh, right? Keep yourselves from all covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, A ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he reasoned within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have not wherewith to bestow my fruits? What he meant was on himself. There's obviously always a good place to bestow your fruits. There's never any lack of people in need around us, you know. And in this way, Jesus said, store it up in heaven where it will not fail you when you have a need. Remember what he said, how equality worked. You know, your abundance being a supply at this present time for their want, that later their uh, uh, abundance will be a supply for your want, uh, that there may be equality. He said, I have not wherewith to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my grain and my goods. And I will say unto my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, his whole faith for the future is what he can supply for himself. Oh, boy, is a lot of prosperity people going to be in big trouble coming, folks, because God's going to take all that away. And the only thing you're going to have left is your faith and your trust in God and your seeking first of his kingdom and your uh, giving to other people. The, 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 the thing that he actually commanded in the scriptures, right? But God said unto him, Thou foolish one, this night is thy soul required of thee. And those things which thou hast prepared, who shall they be? They'll be somebody else's. You wasted your time. You sowed into the world. And it's gone. So, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You lay up treasures for yourself, you're not rich towards God. If you sow it up in uh, the kingdom of heaven by meeting the needs of the brethren around you, he said, it will not fail you. Uh, you know, when Joseph talked about storing up the grain, you know, for the seven years, in the seven years of plenty. We just came through the seven years of plenty, folks. The seven years of famine are now coming. And um, people obviously see that Joseph is Jesus in the Bible, you know, because he was sold for silver, sold by his brethren into the hands of the Gentiles, cast into prison, you know, on and on. Same story, you know. But but when it comes to storing up their their grain, they see it physically. They don't see it spiritually anymore, you know. But you know what? Jesus said, don't store up your treasures on earth where moth and rust and thieves break through and steal. Store it up in heaven. And he tells you how to store it up in heaven. You store it up in heaven by uh, making for yourselves persons that wax not old, by meeting the, the brethren's needs around you, you know, making sure nobody does without, seeking equality that God said he desired. And and that's how you store up for the seven in the seven years of plenty for the seven years of famine, because he tells you here that it won't fail you if you store it up in heaven. It won't fail you. We're storing it up under Joseph, all right, but Joseph is Jesus. And we store up in the kingdom of heaven by being good stewards, uh, not by being good owners, good stewards. A steward is somebody that handles what doesn't belong to them uh, righteously, right? And Jesus said, if you don't renounce everything you have, you can't be my disciple. We can't be owners anymore. We're 100% stewards now. And if we don't handle this honestly for God, he said, who will give you that which is your own? In other words, God has a gift to give to us. But what we're dealing with down here as stewards belongs to him. And he's telling us he wants equality. He wants everybody's needs met. You know, he wants the basics for everyone to have. Instead of some um, living um, high on the hog and others doing without. That's what he wants. Sorry, Michael, I ran away with that, didn't I? <laughs> oh, not a problem. I, I love listening. I, I, I think we can... Uh, you know, en encompass everything that we've been trying to say in the following phrase. You know, the cure for covetousness is looking out for the interests of others before yourself. I, I remember uh, traveling to Oregon one time, and there was a pastor in a wheelchair. And every time this man would see me, you know, we were there for a week-long crusade, 
the, the first question out of his mouth, are you okay, do you need anything? And, and he could have preached a thousand sermons to me. His nature spoke to me more than those sermons would have. You know, he was in a wheelchair. I, I, I should have been asking him if he needed anything. But every single time that he ran into me in his church or when we went out to lunch, are you okay, Michael, do you need anything? You know, we need to have the nature of Christ. And the nature was, uh, uh, of Christ was selflessness. He was always looking out for, for the needs of others, for the interests of others, and always, you know, kept nothing for himself. He came to this earth to pour himself out, to, to sacrifice himself that we might have salvation. And if we follow his example, you know, I, again, this, this is not a pitch from the, to, to give to ministries, but there's so much need, you know, in a, in a two-block radius of wherever you live. Anybody who's hearing my voice today, there is so much need within a two-block radius of where you live today, you wouldn't even imagine it. And it's not necessarily having to do with money. Uh, you know, it, it, there is so much that can be encompassed in the word need. And God will speak to you in, in what manner you should provide for that person's need. Somebody just needs a shoulder to cry on. Somebody just needs to hear that, that God loves them. Somebody just needs a hot bowl of soup. Whatever it is, we're here as God's ambassadors on earth, and we're here to show the heart of Christ, heart of Christ to the world. You know, this, this is this is why I, I, I think that uh, the, the persecution of the saints will be exacerbated because the world is looking and, and they're not seeing, you know, the guys that are doing good. They're seeing the guys with, 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 you know, the flash rides and the private jets and, and who are unwilling to submit to the authority of Caesar. And, and it's, it's them that are fueling their anger. And, you know, after a while, these people are going to go under the rocks. They're going to hide in the caves uh, because they don't want to deal with it. Their faith is not strong enough to endure or suffer persecution. They had a good time faith, and when the good time ends, they're going to run. And those that will be left will be the saints of God who will stand firm on the foundation of the truth, who will stand firm on the foundation of Christ. And it is they that will suffer even though what spurned the persecution wasn't them. Very true, very true. Well, I believe that God's people are going to be um, very different in the very near future because of God taking these things away. And because of the persecution that's coming, all this is necessary. Persecution has a way of humbling you, softening you up, uh, making you very careful about God, about pleasing God, and about serving God, about your brother. Uh, the church is going to be very, very different in the future. And uh, I just praise God that he is working all things together for our good, even these hard times. Many people think that God has is, is deserted them in these times. Because of the things that they value, uh, the, the problem is the things that they value are not the things that God values. Yes, God does want our needs met. He, um, he uh, believes in equality. He believes the church should share and share alike. Some people have a greater gift to share the material things. Some people have a greater gift to share the spiritual things. And, uh, of course, Paul said that both should be taking care of one another, you know, in uh, 1 Corinthians 9. So, you know, um, I'm, I'm very encouraged about what's coming. I know that God is going to bring down the big ministries, and I know that some of the people that are given to those will start giving to things that are more spiritual and more scriptural. And uh, I know that the supplies of uh, the ministries that God is raising up, they're going to have no problem whatsoever. They're going to have no problem whatsoever. Uh, the Lord has told us this, this over and over, that He is going to supply those needs. And, um, you know, I, I believe that God will give you everything you need to do His will, but not so you can heap it upon your flesh and cause bring destruction to yourself. You know, like uh, um, we just read in Timothy 6 there. You know, uh, that's um, when you, you feed your flesh, it will conquer you. Remember, that's the, the giant in the land right there. Uh, you, you, you know, I, the old saying about feed the black dog, uh, he'll whip the white dog, and feed the white dog, and he'll whip the black dog. You know, well, that's it's very true. You know, you keep feeding your flesh what it wants, um, it will conquer you. And uh, you know, the Apostle Paul said, you know, that um, 
he uh, kept his body under, and he buffeted his body, um, uh, lest after he had preached to others, he would be a castaway. You know, don't give your flesh what it wants, you know. Um, uh, make sure you live a, um, a consecrated life to the Lord. Make sure you, you know, some people, uh, obviously a lot of God's people believe in fasting, but do you carry it so far is a spiritual fast. In other words, don't feed your flesh. You know, just don't feed your flesh, no matter what it is. It's not necessarily food, you know. A spiritual fast not necessarily food. But if you feed your flesh, it will whip your spirit. You know, you will lose the battle. You know, we're not here to consume as much as we can and get as many toys uh, and end up with the most toys. You know, I mean, he that dies with the most toys wins, some people say, you know. No, that's not what we're here for. We're, we're here to lead a crucified life. Crucifixion is for the death of the old man. The old man is the one who desires all those things, who lusts after the things of the world. And uh, that's the old man. If you let him live, he will conquer you. You know, if you, through the sacrificial life, will buffet your body, that means don't give it what it wants. Conquer it. Beat it. Uh, if you do that, God will cause your spiritual man to grow up, and uh, you'll be a humble person, and you'll never have your needs not met. You know, Jesus... Um, led the crucified life long before he was ever physically crucified. And God could use him to meet the needs of the people around him. He was full of faith because the old man was dead, you know. And uh, he was able to multiply the fishes and the loaves, which is, of course, where we're going, folks. I'm telling you, this is how God is going to supply our needs in the days to come. It's going to be miraculous. It's going to be out of heaven. It's going to be wilderness living, you know, that God's going to do it. He's going to multiply the fishes and the loaves. He's going to make things out of nothing. And uh, what you need more than anything, the most valuable thing you're going to have in the wilderness is holiness. And the second most valuable thing is faith. If you've got holiness, you'll have faith. If you've got faith, it's because you're holy. And uh, those two go together. You know, in the coming tribulations, if you've got those, your needs are always going to be met. Not only that, you're going to be like Jesus and, and his disciples. You're going to be able to be one of the ones that supplies everybody else's needs. Praise be to God. The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. And that's where we're going. We're going into a wilderness, not necessarily um, of Egypt's supply, but of God's supply, out of heaven, you know, out water out of the rock, you know, uh, uh, manna out of the sky, you uh, know. Uh, The coins out of a fish's mouth. Uh, You know, all the wonderful things that God is able to do through our weakness, you know. His power is made perfect through our weakness. And uh, he's going to multiply your seed for sowing. That's what he said. He talks about the liberal person, you know, that uh, gives bountifully. Uh, He said he would multiply their seed for sowing. And that's what he's going to do, you know. I mean, it's not for keeping. These uh, guys think that, well, uh they get richer and richer and richer, and they give their 10%. <laughs> that ain't what God said. God said equality. That means you don't ever get rich. You make your brothers rich. You make, you make sure that there is equality around you. Everybody's needs are met. That's what you make sure of, you know. And then you'll have treasures in heaven, eternal treasures in heaven. Why squander it down here, folks, when you can have it for eternity, you know. I want the treasures of the gold and the silver and the precious stones that, that equate to the life and the nature of Jesus Christ. That's what I want. And the wood, hay, and stubble that equates to the old life, the old man, the old selfish person. Let it be burned up in the fiery trials. Deny it. You know, buffet yourself like, like the Apostle Paul said, you know, lest after he had preached to others he'd be a castaway, you know. We're just passing through this world, folks. Don't let it stick to you, you know. Just passing through. We're just sojourners. Uh, these are the people that God has chosen to be his people in these days, you know. Uh, pray for repentance for the prosperity-minded people. These poor people, that's where their faith is. When they lose it, they'll be jumping out of windows, I'm telling you. You need to pray for them. You need to pray for them, that God would grant them repentance, that they would find out what what is really important in this life, you know. Uh, joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Right, Michael? Yes, sir. You know, what, what I find amazing is that 
the less of us there is, the more of him there is. And, you know, our, our intent and our goal and, and our target is for there to be none of us and all of him. When, when, when we come to that point is, is when we've sanctified ourselves. Uh, and too many people today are, are looking out for themselves in, in, in such a way that they don't leave room for God to speak to them. I know men that I've looked in the face as they were weeping and said, God told me to do a thing, and because I thought it better to keep it for myself, I didn't do it. And I lost it anyway. You know, we need to come to terms that when God speaks to us, whatever it is that he would have us do, we must do joyfully. Because we serve a God whose hand is not short, who will reward us for our obedience. The Bible says that because Jesus humbled himself, because Jesus made himself of no reputation, God exalted him above all others. We need to realize that God does reward his children. And it may not be in the material, because the material is irrelevant to God. But as we begin to understand the beauty of the kingdom of God and the beauty of the gifts that God has for us, we will inevitably desire those things above the material things. You know, it's like a child that prefers a red balloon over a diamond because the balloon is flashier. This is how the prosperity thinking, as they like to call it, you know, can be equated. Because they don't understand the true value of the things of the kingdom, they prefer the things of this earth. When we begin to understand the true value of what God has for us, we will only desire the things that he has for us. The things of this earth will, will seem as they are, nothing, passing, ash and dust. Amen. You know, I was thinking back just now, you know, at the times that are most valuable in my life, you know, um, over the last 35 years of knowing the Lord and, and serving Him. And the, the things that stick out the foremost in my mind is not the times when I had a lot of peace and prosperity. It was the times when I got to see God's care and love for me, when I didn't have anything. And uh, yep. those things have stuck in my mind, and I and they give me confidence, and they and they give confidence to other people. You know, I have you know walked out totally by faith uh, with my family, and uh, trusted God to, to be our supplier, and not told anybody our needs, and never taken up an offering, and done those things, and 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 even when you get down to the where, as I call it, you're looking over the cliff, and there just doesn't you don't see any visible means of supply when god answers you and he will answer you if you walk by faith in him and you trust him and you're seeking his kingdom around you he will answer you don't ever believe what the devil tells you and when he answers you you get a a profound sense of his love and care for you and you wonder, why did I ever worry? Why did I ever worry? I remember when I, you know, I had been many years in um, part-time ministry, as they call it, although I worked pretty hard in part-time ministry. Uh, but when I went into full-time ministry, I had no visible means of support, you know. And I learned something through that because um, I walked by faith. I didn't, uh, again, tell people my needs nor ask anybody for anything. And, and yet... As I did that, we came to those places where I had to trust God and keep on going, and God always, always came through. But you know what? Every time I would come to the edge of the cliff, I worried a little bit less than the time I did before. Until I came to the place that God calls the rest. That's a total ceasing from your own works, a total a lack of anxiety about God's supply, whether it be physical, spiritual, whatever, you know. the You know what? The Lord just wore me down. You know, I remember, I can remember back when I worried a little bit about what is going to come around the next corner and how God's going to supply my need. But you know what? Every time I go through that trial and walk by faith, forced myself to confess and to give thanks to God for his supply, gave when I needed what I gave, or uh, or believed by not telling someone else my faith. Uh, whenever I did those things, God always came through. And you know what? 
um, every time I went through the trial, came up to the cliff, and saw God answer, uh, the next time it was easier, and the next time it was easier, and the next time it was easier, until I never had to worry. I never worried again about God supplying my need. In fact, I have to be honest with you. There's been many times when I have not even prayed about it. Some people, you know, think you've got to pray through, pray for six months, or pray in a hollow log, you know, <laughs> whatever. Well, uh, I have to be honest with you. When you enter into the rest, <clears throat> you may not pray as much about things. But when you do pray, God will hear you. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, uh, I, I think in some cases people think that prayer is, um, is salvation by works. They think if they don't pray enough, then God's not going to answer. Well, no, it's not the truth, folks. God's looking for quality, uh, not necessarily the quantity. And, and, and he's looking for you to be consciously in contact with him all the time. Not, not, the, not the false, phony thing about praying for an hour every day. There's nothing wrong with praying for an hour every day, but that's not what God desires in the New Covenant either. What he desires for you to do is to talk to him all the time. I mean, you are the temple. He is the one that dwells in that temple. He's with you all the time. He wants you to practice his presence. He wants you to talk to him. He wants fellowship with you. He wants you to lay everything before him. And uh, that's the kind of communication God wants, not the Old Testament type relationship of pray for an hour in the morning and the evening. Oh, no. No, he's got something better than that for you. You know, he, you're the temple of God. And you, he, you carry him with you everywhere. And he wants to talk to you, and he wants you to talk to him, and he wants you to lay things in his hands by faith and not worry about a thing. And uh, God just wore me down, you know, as I went through trial after trial after trial. He wore me down. I, and I haven't worried about God's supply in many years, whether it be for health or for uh, um, monetary needs or anything like that. You know, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You know, and uh, God is faithful to his word. He is a faithful supplier. We need to get this message out to the people of the world. You know, they are wondering how in the world God is going to take care of them in these times, you know. And the people, I'm talking even about Christians who are the people of the world too, you know. They're wondering, how is God going to do this? And they've tried to set things aside, and they've tried to hoard up. And then they go and look and come to find out it's bread worms. You know, in some kind of a way, it's bread worms, you know. They stored up their treasures on earth, and the moth and the rust and the thieves came through and stealed it, stole it. And um, they're still doing it right now, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, storing it up in gold and silver and so on and so forth. I know I'm getting on some of you, but that's just the way it is. It's the facts, you know. Jesus said, don't do it, and, and he had his purpose in that. It's because he wants you to trust in him. He doesn't want your faith in anything you have in this world, you know. So... I'm probably stepped on some toes there, but that's okay. So, what well, do you think, Mike? Uh, you still with us? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm still here. I, I, I just wanted to c- complete uh, a thought. Uh, those who walk by faith realize that God never fails. Uh, that's 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 the one thing that I learned in 25 years. One thing that I am certain of: if you walk by faith long enough, you realize that God will never fail you. Okay, He may delay in your own opinion although in his time it's perfect but God will never fail his children I have seen miracle upon miracle uh, that, that I can attest to that God has done and it's not only financially I mean we, we, we talk about this because it's, it's irksome to see so many people deceived by, by the wolves but you know in every area of your life God will not fail you whether it be your health your joy, your peace, every area of your life is, is, is capable of being more when you surrender to God. And, and this is the beauty of our journey and our walk. It, it, it's not subservience without reward. It's surrendering to God and receiving more from Him than we would have had on our own. It, it, it's, it's a beautiful journey. Amen. Amen. And, uh, you know... I, I lean a lot upon the things I've seen the Lord do in my past. And uh, I want to tell you, you can't get anywhere in this world where God 
cannot supply your needs. My God shall supply your need according all your needs according to his riches and glory. You cannot get anywhere. And I've seen God multiply food, but I've also seen God do something that it amazes me until this day. And that is put food right straight in your stomach without you ever eating it. <laughs> and I'm telling you, you can't get anywhere on this earth where God cannot supply your needs. And I, you know, I, I <clears throat> we raised five kids and, um, they, you know, as long as they were under my roof, they didn't know what a doctor was because we prayed for them and we stood in faith and, and, uh, God healed them. And um, they saw God do miracles. They saw God multiply food. They saw God multiply money. They saw God put gasoline in tanks that were empty. Uh, they saw God put food in their stomach. And uh, I, I remember one time, I'm just going to share this with you, that we, uh, my wife came to me. She said, well, we, we don't, well we've, I've done my best, but we've run out of everything in the house. <laughs> she said, what to do? I said, set the table. <laughs> set the table, you know. And little did I know, we weren't even going to need to use that table that she set, you know. But uh, we, we gathered around, me and my five kids and my wife. We was around that table. We had nothing left in the house, you know. We wasn't going to call nobody or tell anybody. We never did, ever, ever. And we wanted, we always wanted to see God come through, you know. And so we gathered around the table. We held hands, and I said, a real simple prayer. I said, Father, we know you sent us, and um, we know you promised to supply all of our needs. So I'm asking you, Lord, either to fill these plates or fill our tummies. That's the first time I ever thought about that, you know. Fill these plates or fill our tummies. And um, when I got through praying, I looked up, and and um, I think the first one to talk was my my oldest boy. And I, I never thought I'd hear him say such a thing. He said, Dad, I'm full. He says, I don't need to eat, you know. So <laughs> he he got up, and I looked over to another one. They said, yeah, I'm full, too, you know. <laughs> Went all the way around the table. Before, I was so intent looking at them that I wasn't even thinking about myself. And when I thought about myself, I says, yeah, I'm full, too. <laughs> and we got up from the table, and we didn't eat that day, but we were full. And I think, you know, God can do that. He can take care of you anywhere, you know. If he can, if he can bring your taxes out of a fish's mouth, and I've seen him do such things as that, and I've seen him multiply food in the pot, you know, and uh, and I've seen him put gasoline in my tank. In fact, I've seen him do it for weeks on end. And um, you know what? God loves to do miracles. He loves to supply your needs. Be anxious for nothing. Just let your prayers and requests be known unto God with thanksgivings. And the, and the God of all peace will guard your heart and your thoughts in Christ Jesus, you know. And it, but, but, of course, there in Philippians, he, he tells you how to think. Whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Don't think on those things the devil tries to fire into your mind. This is not the Word of God. My God shall supply your every need according to his riches and glory. He didn't say greed. You know, you don't need enough to last a week. You only need enough to last a day, right? Yeah. Besides, you'll have to pack it, or you'll have to store it, or you'll have to, you know, don't worry about it. Be anxious for nothing. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, you know. This is what we need to understand. We need to know that He is a good God. He's a good Father. He would not do what many of you fear He might do. He would never do that. You see, that that very fear, that very doubt about him is what gets in the way. You know, James chapter 1, the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Think not that that man shall receive anything of the Lord. The way you receive from God is through faith. That's the way you walk in the Spirit. You walk in the kingdom. No matter where you get, God is there. He can do it. He will do it. He will take care of you. Be anxious for nothing. My thirsting soul, pure as water, make me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow, oh Jesus. I trust in you. Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word is true, oh Jesus. 
trust in you.